He's a terrifying enemy of G.I. Joe. Destro is his name. Destro is his name. G.I. Joe, American hero, fighting evil Destro. Hey, hey, welcome to Half the Battle. And welcome, my friends, to Main Character May. All this month, we're going to be focusing on just one character. And, well, you've seen the title of this video, so you know it's going to be Destro. For today, we're going to be focusing on the figures from the original toy line. So meet Destro version 1. This figure was released in 1983 with all original body parts. And it's unique in a number of ways. Some obvious, some less so. We'll start out with the thing that stands out the most by a mile. His head. He's got a shiny metal noggin. This reflective silver look was created using a process called vacuum metallizing. In a nutshell, an object, in this case the head mold, is placed in a near airless chamber where they pump in metal vapor, aluminium most of the time, that condenses on the head to make it shiny and chrome. By the way, this process is explained more clearly on the Transformers wiki than on the actual Wikipedia. Figure that one out. So yeah, this certainly made Destro stand out in 1983. If you knew nothing about G.I. Joe, but saw this in the toy aisle at the time, you'd be forgiven for thinking he was some kind of robot or android, as he's got that weird 70s robot look going for him. But of course, we all know it's a mask. Still, this feature made it a quite popular toy. It's not the only unique thing about him, though. It's not immediately obvious when the figure is by itself, but he's actually a little bit taller than other G.I. Joe figures of the time, being closer to 4 inches instead of 3 and 3 quarter inch. He shares this aspect with Sergeant Slaughter. Anyway, on to the rest of the figure. That... that is quite a look, isn't it? Yeah, subtlety isn't in Destro's vocabulary. The first thing that catches your eye is that magnificent plunging neckline that goes right down to the navel. To say nothing of the chain with a ruby and the collar. Under most circumstances, a predominantly black outfit with some red and silver would be subdued. But this is anything but. It's a bold look even without a mask. The detailing is also impressive, especially for 1983. The outfit has plenty of folds and creases, making it look more like real clothes. And his wrists are very well done, with mini missiles on one and I think darts on the other. With all that, you'd almost forget his holster or the microphone on his jacket. The only bit of criticism I have, and it's very minor, is that he doesn't have colored eyes, adding to that robotic look. Though, due to the way the fact metalizing process worked, this would have been difficult to add after the fact, especially in 1983. It's not a big deal. Destro came with two accessories. A gun that's quite small and easy to lose, so good luck finding it almost 40 years later, and a backpack that opens up to reveal molded weapons. It looks really nice and has great detailing, but the stuff inside is too small to resemble actual accessories. Also, you can tell this backpack is supposed to double as a briefcase, but they really should have added a handle to it for that look. Overall, this is just a great figure, and at the time a unique addition to the toy line. I like to believe it helped G.I. Joe stand out just a little bit more in the toy stores way back then. I really dig this look, but I can understand how it could be an acquired taste at best for others. Given what an important character this was, a second figure for Destro was inevitable. But did it live up to the original? Yes, yes it did! So meet Destro version 2. This figure was released in 1988 with all original body parts, and is also known as Iron Grenadier's Destro. And once again, the first thing that stands out is his head. It's still vac metalized, but now gold instead of silver, meaning he looks less like a robot now and more like an Oscar. Also, this head is ball jointed so it can move up and down as well as side to side, unlike the original. The second thing that catches your eye is that he's got a cape. Well, half a cape, really. It only attaches to one shoulder and doesn't cover his entire back. Still, it looks nice and is made of actual cloth, so I appreciate the effort that went into this. Version 2 is just as tall as the first, so it also continues that tradition. Plus, this one looks a bit bulkier, like he's got more muscles and didn't skip leg day. One thing is very different. The plunging neckline is gone, meaning he looks less like he belongs in a 70s disco. There's also far less red on the figure itself, just the ascot in fact, and just a hint of silver on the legs and upper chest. The silver on the legs can be a bit of a problem, as it's not too difficult to rub off, leading to lots of figures out there with paint wear. Same goes for the gold on his belt. 
And I didn't mention this with the first version, but those silver and gold heads can get dull over time, losing their shine. Version 2 came with just one accessory, a golden sword that could attach to a hook on his waist. While it makes him look very regal, together with the cape, it's a pity that it's stuck in the sheath, as it's just one molded piece of plastic. It would have been better if he came with a second unsheathed sword. Oh, and yes, I'm aware that he came with a vehicle, Destro's a spoiler, but since I'm handling vehicles and figures separately, that's a review for another time. Overall, this is an excellent update of the original, while still having his own distinct look. As far as I'm concerned, this was another triumph. Of course, some fans may have been disappointed the neckline and collar were gone. But believe me, Hasbro has got you covered with the next version! So meet Destro version 3. This figure was released in 1992 with all original body parts. And holy crap, they freaking doubled down when it came to the collar, didn't they? They went full anime with this one. This version is a hybrid of the first two, the best of both worlds. Or the worst of both worlds, depending on your view. It's got the buffness of version 2 with the aesthetic of the first, though both are exaggerated. The most disappointing thing about this figure is that his head is no longer shiny. They opted for the far cheaper silver paint instead of the vac metalizing process. And while this does mean he now has actual eyes you can see, and he has an actual expression on his face now, a stern one, the lack of chrome does take something away from the character. Still, that color! You could sell it to a water park as a slide attraction. Another difference with the previous versions is that this one is shorter, meaning he's the size of an average G.I. Joe figure of the time. Which is fine when put next to those figures, but makes him look like their little brother here. Detailing-wise, I'd say he's on par with the others, but nothing really stands out. When it comes to his accessories, there's something interesting there. He has a rifle that looks a lot like the ones Cobra Troopers and Officers sometimes used in the Sunbow cartoon, but wasn't an accessory for their figures. By 1992, the Sunbow series was long gone, so this is a weird homage, but a welcome one. He also came with a disc launcher that really launched discs. It's stupid! Moving on! One last thing I want to say is that you have to be kind of careful if you try to find one on the secondary market, as this figure is almost identical to version 6 from 2001. The easiest way to tell them apart is that the modern version has red detailing on his arms and legs, and he's got orange shoulder pads instead of red ones. Still, they're easy to mix up. In fact, I'm pretty sure I've used the 2001 version by mistake in an old video of mine, and nobody noticed. Overall, it's an okay figure, but doesn't measure up to the previous ones. Personally though, I like the head, and use one on the body of a version 2. I think it looks pretty neat like that. There was one more Destro figure in the original line. Does it hold up to the good quality of the previous entries? No, no it doesn't, because it's this one! Meet Destro version 4. This figure was released in 1993 with some original body parts, and was part of the Armor Tech line of figures from the Star Brigade line of G.I. Joe. Yeah, he's part of a sub-team of a sub-team, if you can believe that. He shares the legs and right arm of the bat that came out the same year, since they're both from 1993. I guess they both have all original parts then? You know what? It doesn't matter. Let's move on. Let's start with the positive. The Vec metalized head is back. That's it? That's the only positive thing? I mean, he looks like a Microman had a baby with a Transformer, for God's sake. Okay, fine. One more positive thing, the color scheme, red, black and silver, is on brand with Destro's previous looks, so that's nice, but that really is about it. His left arm is a missile launcher. Where is his actual left arm supposed to be? It won't fit in there. So, does he have it crammed against his torso or something? And then how does he even operate a rocket launcher? Positive thinking? Looking at it more as a toy, Armor Tech figures had limited articulation compared to what we had come to expect from G.I. Joe figures. There's no ball joints anywhere, not in the shoulders, not in the thighs, and the one elbow joint only moves up and down. Also, the head only moves side to side, and it barely even does that, so I don't think that's an homage to the 1983 one. Though, looking at the head, I do have to concede there's one more positive thing. Even though it's fact metalized, the eyes are actually colored in on this version, so I'll begrudgingly give some kudos for that. 
And that really is it. This isn't leading up to some big twist where it turns out that I actually like this figure. Armor tech sucks and it's stupid. The accessories are further proof of that. They're generic weapons on a plastic tree that are cheap and just weird. The only unique one is the helmet, which frankly looks like a fishbowl. Also, over the years it can get its own brand of yellowing plastic, making it harder to see through. It kinda makes it look like he's got a golden head. Yeah, of all the four toys Destro got in the original line, this one is the worst. And that would be kind of a downer to end on, so we're not gonna do that. I'll briefly talk about one more figure from the 80s that used Destro's mold. And who is that? They called him the Jackal. Meet the Red Jackal. This figure was released in 1984 by Palatoy Toys in the UK and Europe with no original body parts. And yes, I am using pictures from eBay because screw paying that much for a slight paint redeco. Hey, if any of you want to drop that kind of cash on a figure like this, more power to ya. It's just not high on my own collecting priority list. The only differences are that his color is white now, and they painted his magnificent bare chest red, with the red shadow skull and crossbones logo on it. If anything, it makes him look like a pirate. This figure is a neat little curiosity, and is a completely different character from the Destro the Baroness knows and loves. Or is he? We might swing back to that later this month when we talk about the character. Meanwhile, those were the figures from the original toy line. The worst, and I cannot state this enough, is the Armor Tech version. The best? Well, that's much harder to decide for me. I really like both the original and the second version. Right now, I'm leaning towards the first, but if you'd ask me again in a few weeks, I may have changed my mind. Version 3 is just sorta there. Do let me know in the comments below what your own favorite version is. Next time, we'll take a look at a large selection of the more modern versions. I did debate with myself if I should include the 1997 version in this video, but that would mean I'd have to talk about... HIM. And I'm leaving that for later. Today, we'll be taking a look at a selection of figures that came out after the original toy line ended. And that means we have to start with that greatest of all G.I. Joe years, 1997. Yes, the year by many considered to be the worst for G.I. Joe, including those years where Hasbro actually didn't produce any new toys, is back. Though when it comes to Destro, it wasn't that bad, really. So meet Destro version 5. This figure was released in 1997, big shock there, with no original body parts. It was part of a 3-pack with a Cobra Commander and Baroness figure called Cobra Command Team. And it was part of the 15th Anniversary Toys R Us exclusive Collector's Edition line. It uses the mold from version 3. Look, I've talked extensively about the fluster clock that was the 1997 line. But in a nutshell, Hasbro wanted to use the molds of the original figures to create this Anniversary Edition. Unfortunately, once they were past pre-production, including doing the packaging artwork, they found many of the original molds were damaged or just straight up missing. This included Cobra Commander version 1, that's why it's the armored version in this pack, and Destro version 1, which is why version 3's mold ended up being used. I can only speculate. But I think Destro version 1's mold might have been lost after it was sent to Palatoy to create the Red Jackal, as that mold was never used again after that. Anyway, onto the figure itself. It's a far more subdued version of the 1992 one, with a more sober purple and black color scheme. Can't hide that magnificent color though. Also, the vac metalized head is back, which was honestly a surprise considering how cheaply Hasbro wanted this line to be made. I do like this look, but then again, I always like the more subdued color schemes. The detailing can be a bit sketchy. He's got silver on his chain, arms and legs, but on the one I have, some of it seems to be missing. On the legs at least. And this figure has never been played with, so it came in the packaging like that. Having said all that, Destro is still one of the best figures from 97. Though that is damning with faint praise. Oh, and they gave him the accessories from version 3 too. I'm guessing the gun and backpack molds from the first one were also lost. Overall, it's an okay figure, but like most of 97, nothing remarkable. That isn't to say there wasn't a remarkable Destro figure in that year though. Oh yes, it's time to talk about... HIM! You see, this figure had a variation. An extremely rare variation. 
So rare in fact that for a long time its very existence was in doubt. So rare in fact that I don't have it, so I have to resort to old eBay pictures. And here it is! It's basically the same figure, but with a leopard print on his collar and legs. Oh, and I do mean old eBay pictures. You can't find any for sale. The last one was sold in 2021 for over $5,000. $5,000! Last week, I balked at over a hundred bucks for a red jackal, so you can imagine how I feel about this. It's so rare, I can't even promise you this is a picture of a real one or a custom. When this figure was discovered, the fan community named it Pimp Daddy Destro, because of course they did. So, this toy, what happened? Well, first of all, yes, it is real. It was actually made by Hasbro. This has been confirmed by Hasbro employees themselves. In fact, this was the first design they were gonna use for 1997 Destro, leopard print and all. But when a very limited test run was actually produced and a sample made it back to Hasbro, somebody higher up thought the design was just a bit too out there and ordered a more conservative color scheme. This all happened before the actual anniversary toy line went into production, so this color change was an easy one to make. All in all, it's guesstimated about a hundred or so Pimp Daddy Destros were produced. And of those, maybe half a dozen accidentally ended up in the 3-pack and sent to retail. Probably because someone at the factory said, waste not, want not. That's why on the rare occasions one does turn up, it's more likely to be a loose figure, since a few more of those made it out of the overseas factory. So yeah, forget about the Gold Head Steel Brigade figure, or Mickey Mouse logo Cobra Commander. This is the rarest G.I. Joe toy out there. With the dumbest fan name. Yeah, Hasbro themselves weren't too fond of the nickname, and neither was Arthur Burkhardt, the original voice of Destro. It's hardly appropriate for a children's toy. Still, Hasbro allowed a modern figure based on the leopard look to be sold at conventions in 2007, marking the 25th anniversary of G.I. Joe and the 10th anniversary of the figure itself. It was just called Destro, though. It wasn't until 2021 when they leaned into the pit hard when they released Prophet Director Destro, a classified figure that shared the same initials, PDD, with the 1997 nickname. And that was Pimp Daddy Destro. Well, I'll see you next time, everybody, and... What? That... that's not actually the subject of today's video? We've got other toys to look at? D okay. Well, up next would be the 2001 version, but we already saw that one last week. It's virtually identical to the 1992 one, with minor color differences. The only thing of note about him is that there was a danger of ending up with a lot of unwanted duplicates if you're an army builder, as he was only sold in a 2-pack with a Fast Blast Viper, a troop builder. I'm also skipping over the G.I. Joe vs. Cobra ones, as I don't have them. They look like he's on steroids and have limited articulation due to a new body construction. Nobody liked that! Now, overall, Destro has had, in broad terms, two major looks to him. Iron Grenadier Leader, or Disco King. There was, however, another look, which was basically Waffen SS Officer. So meet Destro version 11. This figure was released in 2004, with mostly original body parts. Yeah, the body is all new, but the head is from a previous 2003 figure. One that I don't have, so I can't really review it, but I will say that every time I see it, I'm reminded of that one photo of the rock with that fanny pack. This one does have a real fascist look to him, something not unheard of with Cobra. But it's still quite a shift from previous figures. It's the first one that actually looks sinister. He's part of the Valor vs. Venom line, and came in a two-pack with Kamasutra, uh, sorry, Kamakura. The figure suffers from the same problem many of the toys from this line had, namely that his torso is too short compared to his legs. Or his legs are too long compared to his torso, depending on how you look at it. There was one more figure that shared this uber strohmann Führer's look. And for that, we have to jump to 2009 and the Rise of Cobra movie line. This is version 23, with all original body parts. He's got a jacket with popped collar and those wide, wide trouser legs. It's sort of based on how he sometimes looked in the cartoon when he's in cold weather gear. You know what it's not based on? The actual freaking movie! Yeah, Destro doesn't look like this in Rise of Cobra. Most of the film, he looks like Doctor Who in a suit. Only at the very end of the whole thing does he even get his mask. So, this figure has little in common with the movie. And honestly, that's not a bad thing. 
Considering he is taller than most original G.I. Joe figures, just like version 1, and he sort of had this look at times in the cartoon, you could easily consider him as another Destro from the 80s. The only argument against that is that this figure has a Cobra symbol on his arm, which really doesn't fit with Destro's character. To round things off, I'll briefly talk about some of the figures that have the modern body construction. Yes, briefly, because this review is long enough as it is, thank you Pim Daddy. They're all from 2007 and 2008, two use the same mold, versions 14 and 17, the last one, version 19, uses another. 14 has the most traditional look, and is from the Cobra Battle 5 pack. While it's a good likeness, he does look a little too thin in my book, shouldn't have skipped leg day. 17 is pretty much the same, though it has a different, in my opinion, worse color scheme. This figure was part of a comic book 2-pack with a breaker figure, and I guess these colors are supposed to make him more comic accurate? Still looks dumb. This one does have a vac metalized head, which I really wish had been on 14 instead. One weird thing that both these figures share is that the oh so famous color is actually an accessory, technically. Yeah, it's removable, though I have no freaking idea why or who thought that was a good idea. And the most baffling part? If you do take it off, a part of his bare chest comes with it. I, I wish I had known about this when I did my video on the dumbest G.I. Joe accessories, because believe me, this would have been up there. As for 19, he's in the style of Iron Grenadier Destro, but uses the comic book colors again. That's because this figure too came in a 2-pack with a comic. It uses the body of version 16, in my opinion the best of the modern ones, that I sadly don't have. He looks sufficiently bulky, especially compared to the other two here. Also, it should go without saying, but all modern figures have extra articulation at the wrists and feet. Oh, and my wish from last week has been granted. Since this figure did actually come with a sword you could unsheath. Kudos on that. And that was my look at some of the Destro figures that came out after the original line ended. I know there are still a lot of them I didn't talk about, because there's just so many and I don't have all of them. Hell, there are over 30, not even counting the classified figures. And today, we'll begin talking about the character, starting with the file cards. And of course, the first will be the 1983 one. Now, considering how much we know about Destro nowadays, it's kind of surprising how secretive this first card is. His real name and birthplace are unknown. We do get a primary and secondary speciality, but note they're not military specialties. They're weapons manufacturer and terrorist. Terrorist? Huh, the 80s really were a more innocent time. Next on the card, we get another staple of G.I. Joe, though it's usually reserved for vehicles. Namely, an incredibly forced acronym, as Destro is the faceless power behind Mars. It stands for Military Armaments Research System. I mean, that is a reach even by this toyline standards. Why have it be an acronym anyway? Mars, the arms manufacturing company named after the Roman god of war. No need to make it more complicated than that. Considering how fond G.I. Joe is of acronyms, it still amazes me they didn't make Cobra one. Anyway, we do get a look at his personality, more at least his philosophy. To him, war is man's most natural state, where its survival of the fittest and the greatest technological advances are made. That last part is true, with World War II leading to advances such as radar, space travel and the microwave. Though I don't think Destro was really in it to invent a better vacuum cleaner or something. The card further says he maintains a luxurious lifestyle around the world. I think this is supposed to explain his outfit, though I don't think the preferred attire of the jet-setting 1% of the 80s was Disco Dracula. He sells weapons to basically anybody who can afford them, and enters battle himself, either with Cobra, as he is their main weapon supplier, or against them if that's more profitable. When going into battle, he dons a silver battle mask, as that's a family tradition. Now that is interesting. The first card implies he only wears the mask when going into combat, instead of wearing it all the time. This would change later on, of course. Oh, and as long as we're talking about the mask, I didn't mention it in the figure reviews, but man, that thing has got to be uncomfortable. How hot does it get in there anyway? After a long day wearing that, sweat socks must seem delightfully musky in comparison. 
The last thing the card says is that Destro respects the Joes for their skills, but abhors them for using those to maintain peace. So he's dedicated to destroying, or at least undermining them. As an aside, the text actually has the word abhor on it, which could have easily been the words hates or dislikes. Larry Hama didn't shy away from using more unusual terms. He was hoping that any child who didn't know what they meant would look it up or ask their parents. An interesting tidbit about the card itself is that on the 1983 and 1984 cards, the G.I. Joe logo is underneath his portrait, even though, as the last paragraph clearly points out, HE AIN'T A JOE! The 1985 card does have the Cobra logo, though. I think this was done to show he was a figure from the G.I. Joe toy line, but separate from Cobra, only for that to be dropped in 85. Kinda like how the cartoon theme song changed from G.I. Joe against Cobra and Destro to Cobra the Enemy. Overall, I really like this card. It tells you enough about Destro while still keeping plenty of mysteries that could be revealed at a later date. And revealed they would be on the second file card! Version 2, aka Iron Grenadier Destro's card does tell us much more. First and foremost, we learn his real name, James McCollum Destro. Meaning that Destro wasn't a code name, but his actual last name. What is it with the bad guys just using their real names all the time? Honestly, I'm not too fond of this revelation. Destro is just the word destroy with the Y taken off, and makes for a cool code name. Having it retroactively be his real name has the same feel to me like trying to justify the Mars acronym. There just wasn't any reason for it. Still, Destro he was, and Destro he would remain. The second piece of new information is we find out where he's from, namely Calendar, Scotland. And yes, I did have to look that up, but it does really exist. Scotland is a real place. Yeah, I'm kidding, but I did have to look up Calendar, and it's a real town that's existed for centuries. It doesn't seem to have a history with arms manufacturing, though. Anyway, the third piece of new information, and indeed a change for the character, is that he's now the leader of the Iron Grenadiers, in addition to being a weapons manufacturer. This is expanded upon in the body of text itself. It seems he's no longer Cobra's weapon supplier, but now pursues his own diabolical aims. He uses his small army of Iron Grenadiers to incite unrest in unstable countries, so he can create a market for his weapons. As his influence grows, he now dreams the dreams that Cobra Commander once dreamed. So what, world domination? That's a bit much. The second paragraph of the card is solely dedicated to explaining why he's got a bucket on his head. Hey, it's a very nice looking bucket, but still. It seems weapon selling has been the Destro family business a very, very long time. So long, in fact, that the Destro who started the family's fortune was caught selling weapons to both sides in the English Civil War. Cromwell's men caught him and made him wear an uncomfortable steel mask as punishment. They didn't kill him because they kinda still needed his weapons. Ever since then, the Laird of Clan Destro has worn one as a badge of honor. Okay, there's a few things to clarify here. There have been quite a few English Civil Wars, the War of the Roses to name just one, but only one actually called that, and it was between Oliver Cromwell and the Royalists. Also, using the word laird here is Larry Hama being clever, as that is the proper Scottish word, the equivalent of a lord. In the sense that a laird is the owner of a large estate. Now, you might think, man, it's a reasonable assumption, that the whole Iron Mask thing was probably inspired by the man in the Iron Mask. Which would be ironic, since the actual historical person that was based on didn't actually wear an Iron Mask, merely a veil to cover his face. The iron part was added later by Voltaire for dramatic effect, I guess? Also, the veil wasn't a punishment, it was most likely used to hide his identity. Or maybe he was thought to be unnecessarily ugly at the time, who knows? So, since this mask wasn't a punishment, it's not where the inspiration for Destro's came from. That's not to say iron masks weren't used as a form of punishment. And it's far more horrific and misogynistic than you think, because that past was awful. It was called a Scold's Bridal, or Branks, and was invented in Scotland. Yeah, see how already it goes back to Destro? It was a mask with a bridle that went inside the mouth to press down on the tongue, leaving the wearer unable to speak. For added horror, that bit often had a spike on it. Oh, and in the vast, vast majority of cases, it was used on women. And for what crime, you may ask? Talking too much. 
No, I'm not kidding. This isn't me making a dumb sexist joke like, oh, oh, women, am I right? That really happened! This thing, which had a spike on it for the tongue, I remind you, was often used at the request of husbands or other family members on women who gossiped, argued, or nagged too much. Let that sink in. Yeah, maybe we should all spend some time screaming into a pillow right now. And it was also punishment for witchcraft, because of course it was. While women were the primary victims of this punishment, history has recorded it being used on men on occasion, especially those convicted of slander. I couldn't find anything about arms dealing, though. So yeah, enjoy this toy, kids. Just don't ask too many questions about the mask. And I thought that Pimp Daddy talk last week got awkward. Moving hastily on, this card represents a change in character for Destro, as he now has his own faction. Hasbro wanted a third faction, or a fourth, depending on how you see Zartan and the Dreadnoughts, to antagonize both the Joes and Cobra, and Destro was happy to oblige. Hasbro even advertised this in a truly epic commercial! Tired of the fanatical ravings of Cobra Commander and Serpentor, Destro goes in alone! Destro's back on the attack! Out to talk to the world on his own! Defeating Destro's army is the anti-gravity pod, the HEV! Who needs Cobra? With my demon and the Iron Grenadiers, neither Joe nor Cobra are a match for me! Go, go! Nobody beats the Iron the real Destro's army destroyed Joe and Cobra find out at Marvel Comics. This file card reflects that by calling him the enemy under his picture. While the Iron Grenadiers were great, they were gone by the time the next figure came out, so that file card makes no mention of them anymore. The card mentions Destro and the commander hate each other, but maintain an alliance of convenience, even though Destro is much, much smarter. Oh, and he has a motto now. If I didn't sell weaponry, somebody really evil would be doing it. Yeah, keep telling yourself that, buddy. The last card of the original line is uh, the Armor Tech one, and explains how he got it. Namely, by attacking a G.I. Joe base and stealing the plans for it. The most significant thing here is that this attack led to a Joe being almost fatally injured, who then needed experimental cybernetics to survive, thus creating Robo Joe. Making Destro history's greatest monster. And those were the file cards from the original line. Now, when it comes to the modern figures and their cards... I'm gonna be a lot more brief. Since most of them don't add much or are just straight up copies of the originals. I will point out anything I feel is significant though. The 1997 one, which was written by fans for Hasbro, recaps some of the comic character's history, so I won't get into it here. The significant bit, apart from the fact that they misspelled his name as James McMullen Destro, is that he's the 17th Laird Destro, making him James McCullen Destro the 17th. The weird thing about that is that the next file card from 2001 has him being Destro the 24th. So he gained like seven ancestors in four years. The 24th was used the most on future file cards. In 2002, Destro had three different figures, and it seems they did an oopsie on the first card. Like version 1, his speciality was terrorist. This was shortly after 9-11, so that word had gotten much darker, and they quietly changed it to Thief from then on. The later file cards basically just regurgitate info from the previous ones. With the modern construction ones being carbon copies of the first, though still with the word terrorist changed to Thief. Personally, if they were willing to change that, they should have also just put his name on there instead of keeping it unknown like version 1. The exception to all of this was the Rise of Cobra card, which explains his silver mask was created by nanites repairing burn injuries on his face. Cause we really needed an additional reason for the mask, I guess! And those were the file cards. We've certainly gotten to know Destro a little better that way, but it's nothing compared to what's in other media. Today, we'll be looking at Destro's character in the comic book. It may shock you to learn that he's in quite a few of them! Strap in, folks! He makes his debut in issue 11, and before we see him, Cobra Commander describes him as so. A specialist, a man with infinite finesse, and a clear tactical mind. If I am the counterpart to G.I. Joe's general flag, then he's the counterpart of Hawk. Great praise indeed! And the first we see of him is... his ass. That certainly is one way to introduce a character. Okay, so I get that they don't want to reveal his face yet, as is clear in the next panel, but really, they could have picked a better shot than that. Also significant is that the Baroness already knows him, but it's not explained further here. 
They keep up not showing his face like he's Dr. Claw or something for the entire issue, and even for the next issue he appears in, number 13, where they keep him in the shadow. It isn't until issue 14 that we get a good look at him, on the cover no less. Yeah, this issue was called Destro Attacks. So they had to, really. We get some strange dialogue here between him and the Baroness, where he begs her to say his new name, which she does, Destro. Even though that's always been his name. I think it's explained later he called himself James McCullen and only recently embraced the old family name, but it's still weird. By the way, it's this early, just three issues after he's introduced, that he's plotting to overthrow Cobra Commander. Dude doesn't waste time, does he? I don't think he'd even finish this complimentary welcome to Cobra fruit basket before trying to take over. In this case, the plan fails because while he leaked the commander's location to the Joes, the Baroness was with him, so Destro had to all ass to save them from the trap he had set himself. Still, the tone was set for a rivalry that would last for the rest of this series. Yeah, things get real Game of Thronesy real fast. The next move comes from the commander as he orders Major Blood to kill him, but this is thwarted by the Baroness, though she pays dearly for that. Presuming her dead, Destro goes catatonic and afterwards leaves for his castle to grieve in peace. Oh, he's in a few battles in between, but nothing really important for him. Though I cannot continue without first showing you this panel of him driving an ice cream truck into battle, because it is awesome. No, you're not getting any context. Go watch my old comic reviews. A good while later, he is delighted to find out the Baroness is alive, and is informed of Cobra Commander's plot to kill him. They immediately start planning to overthrow the Commander again. Honestly, if they put half as much effort into Cobra itself, they take over the world before breakfast. Anyway, this plan fails because of Zartan and Storm Shadow and stuff. Destro does more things then that aren't really important to the character. Look, there's over 11 years worth of comics here, so I'm gonna gloss over everything that isn't significant. Though I will say we see several times how sturdy that mask is, as Destro gets shot in the face more times than you'd think. The next significant thing happens in issue 33, where he unmasks in front of the Baroness to show how much he trusts her. This shocks her so much she faints. Oh come on Baroness, he ain't that ugly. Seriously though, she already knows what he looks like, so maybe she was overcome by that gesture or something. Ah yes, I haven't really mentioned it yet, but Destro and the Baroness are deeply in love, and it's the greatest romance in the G.I. Joe universe. Yeah, forget Scarlet and Snake Eyes, or Scarlet and Duke, or Scarlet and Ripcord. No, oh, really, we should all forget about that movie. Destro and Anastasia is where it's at. We saw this when she saved his life earlier, and we'll see plenty more. Anyway, the other significant thing in this issue is that Destro stops attempt number 47 to remove Cobra Commander by thwarting an assassination attempt by Billy, the commander's own son, as he draws the line at Petricide, showing he has a sense of honor. He even defends the kid at this inquest, but it's a sham trial. The next significant thing starts in issue 49. Where Destro helps Dr. Mindbender in the creation of Serpentor. This coincides with the Battle of Springfield, where he is in charge of evacuating the Cobra population to Cobra Island. He does this out of a sense of honor, not to take over, much to the Baroness's surprise. He even stays behind to save Serpentor, even though he doesn't seem thrilled with how much the Baroness has taken to him. I mean, just look at this panel! After the evacuation, Cobra plans an all-out assault on G.I. Joe headquarters, with the commander, fearful of losing Cobra to Serpentor, deciding to lead the assault himself. This impresses Destro enough that he joins him. This proves to be a huge mistake! As the Joes end up blowing up the pit with the commander and Destro in it, they are presumed dead, but do in fact survive. They make their way out, and by chance find Billy, who's in a coma. Destro gives the commander some encouraging words, and leaves them be. He returns to his home in Scotland, only to find an imposter has taken over. Seeing that he's about true with Cobra anyway, he makes a deal with the Joes to get them the plans to the Terror Drome if they help him get rid of the imposter, which they do. He isn't seen after that for over 10 issues, but returns in number 69. Nice! He seems to have broken with Cobra completely, and is doing what his first file card says he does, cultivating conflict and selling weapons to both sides. This is also where he reveals his own faction, donning his new Iron Grenadier look. And he shows this off during the Cobra Civil War, where the Joes are fighting Cobra, and Cobra is fighting, um, Cobra, when he rolls up like a baller with his whole private army, and then just as T on the beach, letting the other factions fight it out. He does end up taking the airport, but even that's done without much fighting. 
After everybody else is done and Serpent are lost by way of arrow to the eye, Destro rolls up to make his demands. All he wants is that Baroness and he'll leave. The commander is happy to oblige, especially since Destro's army is fresh and complete, while everybody else has taken heavy casualties and are all tuckered out. So he won without almost firing a single shot. Like I said, baller. Ladies, if a guy raises an army and invades a small island nation for you, that's a keeper. The Joes ended up on the losing side, making them an embarrassment to the United States, so some military higher-ups and a senator decide it was an unsanctioned rogue operation and place the Joes under arrest. This bullcrap doesn't sit well with Destro, so he comes in, once again as a baller, and in front of live TV hands the higher-up general proof he purchased the ammo for the Joes operation from him, proving the action was sanctioned. After that, we don't see Destro until issue 87. When Cobra Commander can't leave well enough alone and plans an assault on Castle Destro. What a coincidence, since the comic is called Assault on Castle Destro. The assault on Castle Destro fails. It fails so spectacularly, in fact, that Destro pretty much has the commander by the balls. Also because he knows his true identity and so de facto takes over Cobra. Oh yeah, I didn't mention it, but the guy in the armor isn't a real Cobra Commander. It's not that important for Destro's story arc, though. Destro turns Cobra into an efficient money-making machine. The next part is more about the Baroness and Snake Eyes, who so far been blissfully absent from this episode since he hasn't been relevant to Destro, though they did fight in the past. The Baroness learns what Snake Eyes looks like and thinks he's the one who killed her brother, so goes after him. They're both about to die when Destro swoops in like a... Okay, you get it by now. And explains it wasn't Snake Eyes who killed her brother, saving both their lives. This causes the Baroness to reevaluate her entire life, since this is why she became a terrorist and wants to leave it all behind. Destro, surprisingly, offers to do the same to be with her, giving up running Cobra, Mars, and even wearing his mask. Yeah, and this is the first time we see his face, so that's a huge deal. He and her pretty much retreat to his Scottish castle to live in peace, until issue 116, when Cobra Commander can't leave well enough alone and attacks the castle. Oh, side note, this is the real Cobra Commander again. This is a sort of three-issue miniseries, but part of the main comic, called Destro Search and Destroy. Cobra destroys the castle and captures the Baroness, but Destro escapes. The Commander puts out a contract on Destro while also brainwashing the Baroness, so it looks like it's time for Mr. McCullen to take the cane out of the cupboard once more. He does so by getting a hacker to break into Cobra Commander's financial holdings and starts deleting money. The commander folds like a guy who got Delta 2, a 4, a 6, a Circle of Protection Red, and a go directly to jail card in a poker game. With the Scottish castle in rubble, Destro demands the deeds to the silent castle in Transcarpathia as restitution. Because I guess he really loves castles. There's still the little matter of the Baroness being brainwashed, but it turns out Destro knew and still loves her, even offering to be put in the brainwave scanner, the thing that did that to her. That's kind of a trick, as he uses it to show her a memory of how much he loves her. Oh, while all that has been going on, Cobra has launched a failed attack on the castle. Because have I mentioned that the commander won't leave well enough alone? After all that, Destro and the Baroness once again retire, using the castle that can transform into a more classical look as their home. Until issue 136, when Cobra Commander once again can't leave well enough alone. He attacks and takes the castle, imprisoning Destro and the Baroness, who were caught unawares. Which is weird, because you'd think they'd be used to it by now. They escape their prison and then the castle with the help of the Joes. And not soon thereafter, he retakes the practically deserted castle. It's deserted because the Generation 2 Transformers have shown up, and Destro is noping out of that whole situation, once again living in peace with the Baroness. And you know where this is going. Yeah, it turns out Dr. Mindbender had inserted mind control implants in Destro and Zartan at some point in the past, but died before he could tell Cobra Commander. He then got better. Well, cloned, really, and revealed this. It's triggered by the Commander revealing his face to them, which basically factory resets them to the very first time we saw them, with complete loyalty to Cobra Commander. And this works really well on Destro, he even kills his own family, Darklon, and it remains that way for the rest of the unmittingly short run of the comic book series. That never sat well with me, nor did it with anybody else that ever read the comic. Look, the brainwashing was always meant to be undone, but the series got cancelled before they could get to that. Later stories did put things right though. And that was Destro in the comics. 
If I had to sum him up in one word, it would be honorable. He went from a straight up bad guy to an anti-hero over the course of the comic and was always a pleasure to see. He's also probably the most competent guy in the whole comic. He wins almost all his battles and is almost never outsmarted. He also knows when to cut his losses. If he had ousted Cobra Commander from the first try, Cobra would have won. His relationship with the Baroness is also one for the ages, and it drove him more than greed or power. Also, dear lord do his castles get attacked a lot. It only becomes obvious once you go through the whole comic at once, like I just did, and focus on Destro, but he might as well have offered Cobra Commander a small cottage on his estate to launch his attacks from. Talk about a neighbor from hell! Overall, yeah, I think Destro might be my favorite character in the comic. The only sour note is the way he ended up, being brainwashed without a resolution as the series got cancelled. I was hoping to also talk about the cartoon character in this episode, but I've run out of time. So we're gonna have to save that for next week, as well as any flotsam or jetsam regarding the overall character I haven't mentioned yet. Oh, but what I can still give you today is his entire story arc in the G.I. Joe Retaliation movie. Destro, you're out of the band. There, did you enjoy that? Yeah, boy did he get screwed in the sequel. Today, we'll be taking a look at Destro in the cartoon, and maybe, if there's time, talk about some other stuff too. He made his debut in the opening miniseries, The Mass Device, which I have already reviewed. The opening theme, and it's only this miniseries opening theme, has the words G.I. Joe against Cobra and Destro. All the ones that came after changed it to Cobra the Enemy. It's G.I. Joe against Cobra and Destro. Fight G.I. Joe against Cobra the Enemy. So in the very beginning, they wanted to keep him separate from Cobra, even though the actual plot doesn't really support that. His role here was building the mass device, but much like in the comic, he doesn't suffer fools gladly, so he ends up overthrowing Cobra Commander. In his first appearance, he's a bit more ruthless and evil, not yet the more nuanced character he'd become. Now, while he does show more honorable traits later on in the series... He doesn't have a story arc like he does in the comics, since the cartoon is mostly episodic and only sometimes builds on previous episodes. Also, his role within Cobra changes depending on what the plot of any given episode needs. In The Revenge of Cobra, he's the inventor of the Weather Dominator. With my new invention, the Weather Dominator... I but being Cobra's inventor doesn't last, as they usually kidnap scientists or get an evil scientist of the day to come up with whatever the MacGuffin of the episode is. Sometimes he is actually Cobra's weapon supplier, like seen in Light's camera Cobra. So you can sell us a new one? You saved me! I saved a customer. By the way, this is also the episode where we see that Destro knows what Cobra Commander looks like. Commander, your hood, put it on! It takes a strong stomach to watch me eat! Though, that creates a plot hole in G.I. Joe the movie where it's revealed that the Commander isn't human. Something I think Destro would have remarked upon here. Other times, he's just a high-ranking Cobra. Like in the comic, he and the Baroness are in a relationship, though it's more turbulent. In Spell of the Siren, she uses a magical seashell, just go with it, to brainwash every male in both G.I. Joe and Cobra, except Destro. If you put me under the Siren spell, you'll have no one with whom to share your triumph. And sometimes their relationship is played for laughs. Stop that, Destro! <laughs> she had something in her eye, Cobra Commander. Other times, though, it's deadly serious. Which brings me to one of my favorite episodes, and one that focuses on Destro! Skeletons in the Closet. In it, we learn about Destro's family history, and why he wears a mask, as he explains this to the Baroness cosplaying as Carmen Sandiego. It's a long story, and we will get into that. One of my ancestors was convicted of witchcraft. He was forced to wear a mask over his face for the rest of his life. His descendants were so angered that they vowed to fight the forces of law and order forever. There, another reason for the mask. Not because he sold arms to both sides, not freaking nano machines, but because he was convicted of witchcraft. Yeah, remember earlier in the month when I said the real life things were used as punishment for witchcraft? This episode confirms that's where the inspiration came from! Now, obviously, every witch trial in the history of, um, history was complete bullcrap, as there's no such thing as witches. 
But here, in the fictional world of the G.I. Joe cartoon... Yeah, they may have had a point! Because in this episode, we also learn that Destro's entire family is a Cthulhu-worshipping cult! Okay, it's Cthulhu with the serial numbers filed off, but it's an actual eldritch horror that lives in Destro's basement! So yeah, burn the witch! As an aside, this has nothing to do with Destro, but I don't know when else I'd ever be able to bring it up, so I want to quickly talk about the one real-life witch trial that was actually totally legit. And it's not what you think, or when you think! It happened in 1950, yes, you heard that correctly, 1950, in the Belgian town of Dessel. A couple of villagers accused a local woman of witchcraft, so she sued their asses for defamation of character and won. And that was the last witch trial in Western Europe. I just wanted to throw that historical tidbit out there. Anyway, the Joes find out about this whole thing thanks to Lady J, and the result is Castle Destro getting reduced to rubble. Man, this guy can't catch a break in any continuity when it comes to his house, can he? The kicker is that the Baroness arranged it all to punish him for flirting with another woman at the beginning of the episode. I arranged it all. Why? To make you pay for your unfaithfulness. Hell hath no fury indeed. Also, we learn that Destro and Lady J are distantly related to each other. I checked the records, Destro, darling! You are! The biggest conflict between Destro and the Commander occurs in a parallel universe where Cobra's taken over the world, and they end up starting the Cobra Civil War. Though, since it's another reality... We never find out how that all ended. As the cartoon series went on, Destro was moved more and more into the background in favor of newer characters like Dr. Mindbender, since they had new toys to sell. Still, across the whole Sunbow series, we had a pretty good showing. This brings us to the D cartoon. Oh boy. He appears in the opening miniseries, Operation Dragonfire, and if I had to describe it in one word, it would be inexplicable. First of all, he's in his Iron Grenadier outfit, but that faction isn't a thing in the Deke series. Characters from them do show up, but they're just part of Cobra, and so is Destro. Secondly, and most baffling, he's dumped the Baroness and is now dating Zarana. Which doesn't make sense on any level. Also, Mainframe would be pissed if he existed in the Teak series, which he doesn't. He ends up back with the Baroness by the end of it, and there's really nothing much more to say about him here. He returned in the regular series, sporting his 1992 look, and because this is the Teak series, which was aimed at a younger audience, he's almost as much as a goof as Cobra Commander himself. Also, for reasons I will never be able to comprehend, he uses a stick as a weapon. A wooden club. He's the arms dealer! And that was Destro in the cartoons. Though I have a few more points to make. For one thing, he's supposed to be Scottish, but this voice actor really, really isn't. And you know what? That's fine! I love how he sounds in the cartoon. That deep, menacing voice is what Destro sounds like to me, period. How badly do you want the answer, Joe? Enough to trust me? Plus, we saw them do a Scottish accent in the cartoon, and it, um, wasn't great? I come to talk about the sword! Excalibur it is! Moving on to other stuff, one thing that's always kinda bugged me is that his mask has facial expressions. Hell, this even happens in the comic, but Deke took it to Looney Tunes level at certain points. Sunbow was better about it, and I can understand artistically, but yeah, technically, the mask shouldn't move. To round things off, there's a few other things that I didn't mention in the previous four parts of main character May, but that are still worth mentioning. Firstly, just take a look at Destro and the Baroness. Look at their outfits! You can't tell me these two aren't into hardcore BDSM. Not that there's anything wrong with that, no judgement here. But it's strange to see in a line of children's toys. Secondly, in the Cartoon Network series Evil Con Carne, there's a character called Estroy, who looks an awful lot like a tuned-up Destro. Yeah, this is a straight homage to the G.I. Joe character. While Destro is the word destroy without the Y, Estroy is that word without the D. What's interesting is that I think Destro is a perfectly fine name for a villain, while Estroy just sounds really, really stupid, which I think is what they were going for. Guess you can lose the Y, but you really need the D. Just ask the Baroness. I know it's a horrible pun, but I just had to. Going back to the mask... Yeah, sorry I talk so much about it, but it is his defining characteristic. It's made of beryllium steel. I had to look this up, but beryllium is a real element. Just not one I'd use to make a mask. 
because inhaled beryllium containing dusts can cause a chronic life-threatening allergic disease in some people called beryllosis. That sounds nasty. Lastly, remember this guy, the red jackal? Remember back in the first episode how I said he's a completely different character that only uses Destro's mold? Well, that was true until it wasn't. Okay, so the Action Force storyline by Palatoy started out with their own unique molds and an original storyline, namely Action Force vs Baron Ironblood, this guy, and his Red Shadows. Then Palatoy made a deal with Hasbro to use their toy molds, but recolored them and still being unique Action Force characters like Quarrel, etc. Red Shackle was a member of the Red Shadows, and all of this was seen in their own comic book series. But then Palatoy decided it would be easier and cheaper to just use the G.I. Joe toys as is. No more unique characters, and no more unique story. It would just be G.I. Joe, with the only difference being they still held on to the Action Force name. This was a slight problem for the comic book as it meant a radical shift in the story. How did they solve this? Well, Baron Ironbud got fed up with his forces constantly losing to Action Force, so he himself leaked information on all their bases, causing them to be wiped out by the good guys. Yeah, he destroyed his own organization. Then he went into hiding, changing his appearance and renaming himself Cobra Commander, starting Cobra. So in the UK, the commander is this guy. But wait, what about Red Jekyll, I hear you ask? Well, he survived the Action Force assault and went after Ironblood, now Cobra Commander, for revenge. He found him, but was overpowered. The commander chose to spare him and renamed him Destro, after the last word he screamed as he attacked, destroy. Why yes, this is incredibly convoluted and doesn't make sense if you think about it for more than five minutes, but that's what they did. And so Red Jackal actually became Destro, in a sort of, well, the opposite of a retcon, I guess you could call it, a future con. And with that, we've come to the end of main character May. We saw some cool toys, probably the best character in the comics, and some historical information that will scar us for life. You're so very welcome. Well, I'll see you next time, everybody. And hey, why not like, share, and subscribe if that's your thing? He's a terrifying enemy of G.I. Joe. Destro is his name. Destro is his name. G.I. Joe, American hero. Fighting evil Destro. Introducing Destro.